Hello everyone, this is Professor Suzuki, and in this lecture we will be covering emotion from chapter 10. So what are emotions? Emotions are defined as the subjective state of being often described as feeling. And as we see in the image below, with the little baby with the smiley face and instantly going to the sad face, we know that children tend to cycle through a variety of emotions during the day. We as adults, however, get a better hang of it with how we express and regulate our emotions. However, one thing to keep in mind is that emotion does not equal mood. Your mood refers to a prolonged, less intense, effective state that does not occur in response to something we experience. So our moods are how we feel throughout the day. They're not as strong. We don't really classify that as our emotion. Mood states may not be consciously recognized and do not carry the intentionality that is associated with emotion as well. So there are some slight differences between the two. And so we'll define the components to emotion as well as a few theories of emotion. When it comes to emotion, there are three key components, the physiological arousal, the psychological appraisal, and the subjective experience. Because after all, all of us are different. Some of the things that may scare us may make us happy. Some of the things that may make us happy may make others uh, terrified. It's all a subjective experience. So the first theory we'll talk about is the James Lang theory, the belief that emotions arise from physiological arousal. So if your heartbeat is racing, if you're sweating a lot, then according to James Lang theory, your emotion would be fear. You would, because of that physical response, you feel your emotion. The other hand, we have Cannon-Bard theory, which states physiological arousal and emotional experience occur at the same time. And there's the Schachter-Singer two-factor theory that states emotions consist of two factors, the physiological and the cognitive. So with that in mind, it must seem that because there are all these physiological aspects of emotion, things like polygraphs, these lie detectors that are meant to test uh, the physiological arousal of individuals as they answer a series of questions, you'd think they'd do pretty well. And so below, I'd like you to pause here and check out a few videos I have, the first three. They uh, tell you what timestamps to watch from, or you can watch the uh, whole videos through. But the first one will explain how a polygraph works, and the next two will explain uh, some of the ways you can get around them, as well as their flaws. So please watch that, and then we'll resume. So hopefully, uh, for those who are fans of Psych, you recognize those first two clips were from the same episode. Uh, Detective O'Hara was showing how baselines are created in polygraphs and usually done. But in the second clip with Sean Spencer, we see how to fool a polygraph. The polygraphs are based on your physiological arousal. So if you can keep calm, you can keep your heart rate by <sighs> taking a deep breath, you just may be able to form a polygraph. Likewise, if you saw the last video included the lie to me clip, it's pretty easy to see how other emotions that have physiological responses can be confused as lying and lead to false results of a polygraph. So with that in mind, let's talk about the last theory of emotion here the cognitive mediational theory. And this is the theory that assesses our emotions are determined by our appraisal of the stimulus. So we see the uh, whatever stimulus, let's say this is causing fear, we see this thing that may cause us fear, we think about it and we appraise it in our heads and then we experience the emotion. So below is a nifty chart and we're gonna use fear as the example, the arousal in all cases of the snake, in James Lang theory, we see the snake, our heart starts pounding, we're sweating, therefore our fear is the emotion we express. Fear is the emotion we feel. In Ken and Bar theory, on the other hand, our heart will be pounding and sweating when we see that snake as we feel our fear emotion. Now switching over to the two-factor theory, we see the snake, we are going to have our body responding and we will think about it as well. We'll think, damn, I'm scared, heart's racing, all that's going on and we see the fear emotion. In cognitive mediation theory, however, we see the uh, snake, we think about the situation, and then we have the physiological responses and our emotion. So straying away from the four theories of emotion, let's talk a bit about emotion and the brain. The limbic system is involved in mediating emotional responses and memory. And for those who forgot, the limbic system is comprised of the hypothalamus and thalamus, amygdala, and hippocampus. 
So let's take a look at the amygdala first. The amygdala is composed of various subnuclei, including the basolateral complex and the central nucleus. The basolateral complex is the part of the brain with dense connections with a variety of sensory areas of the brain. It is critical for classical conditioning and attaching emotional value to memory. The central nucleus, on the other hand, is the part of the brain involved in attention and has connections with the hypothalamus and various brainstem areas to regulate the autonomic nervous and endocrine system's activities. Now, the amygdala is well related to mood and anxiety. Changes in the amygdala have been demonstrated in adolescents who are either at risk or have been diagnosed with mood and anxiety disorder. We also see functional differences in the amygdala could serve as a biomarker between bipolar disorder versus major depressive disorder. So if we were to use an fMRI and we see some differences, we can actually have support to see, is this major depressive disorder or is this bipolar going on in the particular brains we're looking at? And of course, there are similar findings with the hippocampus in relation to mood and anxiety. Now, Switching over from the biopsych, let's talk a bit about emotional expression. And there are a variety of rules and theories followed, including the cultural display rule. This, is, this states that one of the culturally specific standards that govern the types and frequencies of emotions that are available or acceptable, depending on the culture. After all, some things are accepted in one culture may not always be accepted in the other, and the same rules apply to emotional expression. In the United States, uh, it's more commonplace to be a little more proud, boisterous. You have a bit of that show-off mentality sometimes, bigger, better. Other uh, cultures, it's not always the same. You keep it more relaxed, below the belt. As we see, depending on the culture, the way you can express your emotion changes. Related to that, there is the facial feedback hypothesis. It is the belief that facial expressions are capable of influencing our emotions. So if you're walking around with a frown all day, you probably feel some negative emotions right there. And finally, let's talk a bit about body language, the emotional expression through body position or movement. And quite frankly, body language says a lot. As we see right here with these two tantruming tennis players, they're probably not in a pretty good mood. And we could probably tell that based just on their body language. Now, before we close up, let's talk a bit about facial expressions. There are seven universal facial expressions. The ones are shown happiness, surprise, sadness, fright, disgust, contempt, and anger. And there's a brief video I'd like you guys to watch about facial expressions and the inability to recognize them. So please check that out and hit resume on this video when you are done. Our final topic for emotion includes facts, the facial action coding sequences. As noted with the universal facial expression, facts, the facial action coding sequence is a way to read the micro expressions. Now there are two videos I'd like you guys to watch. One is uh, facts being explained by the founder himself. So why it's a, a great video to check out. I think he does a better job explaining it than I could, you know, to hear from the source. And also there is a video uh, from the show Lie to Me with fax coding in action. So please watch both of the videos below and be sure to participate in this week's discussion questions.